Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, well, it's good to have everybody in again today, and uh, for those of you in the studio, you can be turning with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to drop in where we left off in our last program in verse 20. Again, we always like to let our television people know that we have all the past programs available in video and little books, and we normally show them on the screen. We also have now the little uh, audio cassette uh, book type things with the same six hours as the videos and the books have. And again, I always like to emphasize, we aren't pushing these to make money on them. We don't make enough on it to amount to anything. But in fact, the books, we feel like we lose a few cents on every one we send out. But we do it only as a service and because we've had so much demand for them. And uh, I want folk to know that when you order and pay for a book, you're not contributing that amount to the ministry or the same way with the videos. But uh, anyway, they are available as, as a service and a courtesy. And uh, you call us or write to us, and we'll be glad to get them out to you. Okay, now I think we're going to get right back into the text, because after all, that's what we're here for, is to study the Word. And now in verse 20, Paul has been rehearsing the whole scheme of resurrection in this chapter, in the first 18, 19 verses, that if Christ did not raise from the dead, if he was not raised from the dead, then we have no hope. Because at the very core, the crux of our gospel is the fact that Christ did raise, be raised from the dead. He was resurrected. Now again, I always like to define that term resurrected because I think even a lot of times our, our ministers and so forth uh, totally use the, the word resurrection out of its true meaning. In other words, anyone that has been raised from the dead miraculously back in scripture, such as the widow's son under Elijah, and such as Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, they were not resurrected. They were merely brought back to life and they died again. Resurrection speaks of that which only Christ began, and that is that he arose from the dead into the eternal, never to die again. And so when we speak of resurrection scripturally, don't think of someone who has merely died and has been called back to life because they're going to die again, as Lazarus did and the widow's son did and others. But once Christ rose from the dead, never to die again, that was resurrection. When we experience resurrection, it's going to be final. We will not again have to die and be brought back to life and what have you. So resurrection is something that only began when Christ arose from the dead. He was the first to be resurrected. And keep that straight, because oh, just the other day again I heard of someone speaking of Lazarus being resurrected. No, he was not. He was brought back to life but he was not resurrected because he died again at some later date. All right, so we've been talking about the resurrection from the dead all the way through chapter 15 on up to verse 19 where we quit. And now verse 20, Paul again, as I've used the expression off and on throughout the, the book of Corinthians, he shifts gears. Now all of a sudden, instead of just talking about the resurrection of Christ at the time of his death, burial, and resurrection, now he goes clear to the end of the age, you might say, and he brings up resurrection as a part of the whole picture of God's plan of the ages. Now, again, when we teach the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, this is the way I like to depict it. This is God's plan for the ages. Now, when I say it's God's plan, I'm sorry, Monty, I guess it's because you're back in the audience, but here we're going to go right from 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to take you back to Acts. You know, every time I do this, why uh, Monty kind of looks up and says, uh-huh, I knew it. But whatever, come back with me to Acts chapter 2. Keep your hand in 1 Corinthians 15. <coughs> But when I speak of God's plan for the ages, what I'm trying to imply is that God, before 
anything was ever created, the triune God put everything in motion. They already had it all blueprinted. And as I have told my classes here in Oklahoma over and over, one of the most amazing things, and one of the things that I find hard, and I'll admit it's hard to comprehend, is that God from the beginning gave men and nations their free will. And they have been operating under that free will. Governments make decisions. They invade other nations. They raise up navies and they produce air forces, supposedly under a free will. But yet, from the beginning of time until the end of God's plan for the ages, everything falls in place exactly as God has predetermined it. Now think about that. Isn't that amazing? How that he can leave men and nations with a free will. They do pretty much as they think they want to do, and yet the end result is bringing everybody and everything to the end of God's purposes. All right, how did it all begin? Well, I like to use this verse in Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 23. Acts chapter 2 and jumping down to verse 23, where Peter, of course, is preaching here on the day of Pentecost. And he's preaching, of course, to the nation of Israel, but he's rehearsing the fact that they had crucified their Messiah. But that's not so much the point I want to get out of this verse as what I've just said, that God has had a plan for the ages from eternity past. Verse 23, Him, speaking of Jesus of Nazareth, whom they'd crucified, Him being delivered by the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and crucified and slain. What's he saying? Somewhere, way back in the eternity past, the triune God in counsel. See, now they didn't have to sit there for a whole afternoon and batty this thing back and forth. But nevertheless, the triune God, sometime back there in the eternity past, came into the Trinity and in a split second of time, or whatever you want to put on it, they determined. Now that's what the word determinant means. They determined a plan for the ages. And in his foreknowledge, he can see every detail of it coming on down through history. Now in that determinant plan that God laid out way back before anything was created, the highlight of it all was the cross. See, and that's what he goes on to say. That in God's predeterminant counsel of understanding, of planning, or whatever you want to call it, and the foreknowledge of God, Israel has taken and crucified and slain. Was God caught by surprise? No. It was all in that eternal plan of the ages, see, that Christ must suffer. And of course, all the way through the scriptures, we have this, that, that this was all in, in God's blueprint for the ages. And this is why I've got my line on the board, and I'm, I told the class before we started, I still haven't made up my mind whether to use it at this moment or wait until I get to chapter 15, verse 51, back to Corinthians now again, if you will. But what I want folk to see and understand, and of course in my classes we go over it almost periodically, and I haven't done it now on the program in a long time, and like I told Iris driving up this morning, the thing that holds me back from repeating a lot of these things is the fact that so many people have bought the tapes, they bought the books, and I just sort of feel as though I'm cheating them when I repeat something on the program. But on the other hand, I have to remember. Probably 95% of our audience never write to us and never order anything, and so they are not getting it repeated. So anyhow, if you'll come back now to 1 Corinthians 15, according to this predetermined plan of the ages that Christ would suffer and die, but he would also be what? Risen from the dead. All right, now back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But Paul says, now is Christ risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits, plural, not the first fruits singular, but he has become the first fruits of those that have slept or have died. 
Now, the only way you can really understand that this, this kind of language is to go back to the Old Testament. And, uh, of course, if you don't understand the Old Testament, you can't understand the New. But come back with me to Leviticus chapter 23. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Is that the way it goes? Almost forgotten myself. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. The seven feasts of Jehovah as we refer to them. And they were feast days for the nation of Israel in their temple worship as they progressed through the year. But as they came to the barley harvest, which of course was the first crop that Israel harvested in, in Palestine, which would be uh, shortly after the Passover, of course. But he comes down into verse 9 of chapter 23, with the third of these seven feasts. First is Passover, and then unleavened bread, and then you come to verse 9 and 10. They have this feast of first fruits. All right, verse 10. The Lord tells Moses, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you are come into the land which I give unto you, and you shall reap the harvest thereof. Now, you want to remember, Israel was an agrarian little nation. They, were, they weren't metropolitan. They were all living off of the land. They, they had their herds and their flocks, and they raised their grain and so forth. So they were an agricultural people. And so he says, when you come into the land and reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the, what? First fruits. See, there's the word. Then you shall bring a sheaf, or a, a bundle, we used to call it when I was a kid, a bundle of the harvest unto the priest. In other words, they were to go into that field of barley. Maybe I can put that on the board. I think I better. I'll come to my lines later. But let's just say there's a little tract of land, uh, 10, 12, 15 acres or whatever, and uh, barley, like I said, was their first grain to be uh, harvested in the spring of the year. And everybody who knows anything about small grains, wheat and barley, oats and so forth, as the field is still green and all headed out, as we say, all of a sudden, scattered throughout that field, will be yellow heads of grain. I'm sure you've all seen it. And it just sprinkles throughout the field with early ripening heads of grain. They have ripened before the mass of all the other stems around them. All right, now then, what were these Jews supposed to do? They were to go into that green field and pluck those early ripened stems with the heads, enough so that they would have a sheaf, and then they would take it to the priest, and it was a wave offering. All right, now read it again. When you are come into the land, verse 10, when you are come into the land which I give unto you, and you shall reap the harvest. See, this is a harvest situation, a farming situation. They're going to get their crop. But before they reap the crop, you shall bring the first fruits to the priest. Now, while you're in Leviticus, you might as well back up to chapter, I think, in 19 is where I wanted to go, because we're going to look at this a little bit later, but I'm not going to have you come clear back to Leviticus unnecessarily. I'm going to make you file this in your little computer. Now, back here in chapter 19, another part of the harvest, after they had gone in and, and harvested the main part of the, of the field, then, you see, they had these instructions. Verse 9 of Leviticus 19. Verse 9, Leviticus 19. After the harvest has been taken, then they were to reap the harvest, and thou shalt not wholly or completely reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of your harvest. And they shall not glean the vineyard, and so on and so forth. And then you come to the last part of verse 10. Thou shalt leave them, the corners and the gleanings, thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. All right, now you, three, you have three aspects then of the Jewish harvest. First, they would go in and take that sampling of the early ripening heads of grain. Then they would go and take the main harvest, but they had to leave the corners and their gleanings for the poor. All right, now keep that process in the back of your mind as we now come back to 1 Corinthians 15 again. 
And so when Paul gives us the clue, that's what I call this, when he says that Christ has risen from the dead and he has become the firstfruits of those who have died. In other words, I think he's telling us, now go back and use the Israeli system of harvest as an illustration of the resurrections, plural, that are coming. Now we have to always qualify, and this takes a lot more time than, than what I've got here. In fact, you know, I, I've used the illustration so often, and I get caught in this, I guess, every time I come up here to, to tape four programs. I've given it before that when Martin Luther was heading to wherever they were going to meet with him after he nailed his 95 thesis on the church door, and he was supposed to meet with the authorities from Rome, as he and his entourage were evidently riding on horseback to wherever city they were going, Martin Luther made this classic statement, and I love it because I find myself there constantly. He said, gentlemen, if only I could tell these men everything that I want to tell them in the first 30 minutes. And what did he mean? If he could just unload it all on them before they would have time to reject it or close their mind to it or whatever. Well, this is the way I feel so often. There is so much in these next few verses that I wish I could just compact it all into 30 minutes, but you can't do it. And so you'll have to bear with me. It's going to take some time. All right, now then, verse 21. For since by man came death, that was Adam, when he rejected God's uh, discipline and was disobeying him and ate the fruit, and Adam died spiritually immediately, but he died physically, of course, 900 years later. All right, so by man, by Adam then, came death. And by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Boy, now that throws a curve at you, don't it? Well, I can understand how Adam plunged the human race into sin and death because he ate of the forbidden tree. But how in the world did he bring back life to the human race? Well, you've got to be careful and compare Scripture with Scripture. Now come across the page, at least in my Bible, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's look at verse 45 and 46. Now this will explain then what he's saying here in verse 22 or 21. All right, you got verse 45? And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made or created a living soul. The last, or the second Adam, it's referred to, I think, in Romans, and the last Adam was made a quickening or a life-giving spirit. Now, verse 46, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Afterward, that which is spiritual, because the first man is of the earth earthy, the second man, the second Adam, the last Adam is who? The Lord from heaven. Now, here we have these two federal heads, if you want to call it that. Adam, as the head of the natural progeny of the human race, plunged us into sin. And sin precipitated Death. Let's look back a minute. I want to do all this with Scripture because, you know, I'm always telling everybody, don't go by what I say. What does the book say? Well, I'm going to show you what the book says. Go back to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. We're not going to hurry because we got a lot to cover, and I'm not going to squeeze it into 30 minutes like I'd like to. We're going to take all afternoon if necessary. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. All with me? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death, let me put in the verb with it, entered by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. All right, that's what Paul is referring to now, by inspiration, of course, of the Holy Spirit. Now come back to 1 Corinthians 15 again. And so, 
the first man, now come back to uh, verse 46 and 47 before you go back to 21. So come back to verse 46. How be it? That was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and after that which is spiritual. All right, now I've made the point in this program ever since we left Genesis that the format of all of God's dealing is first the natural and then the spiritual. Now just stop and think about it. First Cain, the natural. Abel, the spiritual. You can go a little further. First, Esau, the natural, and uh, Jacob, the spiritual. Go back a little further than that. Ishmael, the natural, Isaac, the spiritual. King Saul, the natural, King David, the spiritual. And you go all the way up through Scripture, and then you bring yourselves into the picture. Here we are as sons of Adam. We are born what? Natural. We're of the flesh. But after we have experienced salvation, we've been born from above, now we're what? Spiritual. The Antichrist will come, the man, the natural. And then the Christ will come, the spiritual. And this is the law of Scripture, and that's what Paul is referring to. First the natural, Adam, then the spiritual, Christ. All right, come back into the text. Verse 47 then again. So the first man is of the earth, he was earthy. He was created from the dust of the earth. But the second man is not a created being. It is the Lord himself from heaven. Now here's where we have to have that solid understanding that Christ was not just another created being. He was the creator himself. And see, here's where I have to get adamant against some of the false teachings that are coming in on us like a flood. That Jesus Christ was God, is God, he's the creator, he's the sustainer of the whole universe. And we must never lose sight of that. Otherwise, our gospel is a farce. But he is who he says he is, and that is, he is the Lord from heaven. All right, now let's move on down to verse 28, uh, 48 for just a second. For as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as the heavenly, so are they also that are heavenly. Now those of you who have been with me all these years, you remember that when I taught Genesis 1-1, the first point I made, in the beginning God created heaven and earth. Everything in Scripture is going to be connected to those two entities. It's either that of the earth, and it's earthy, or it's going to be that of heaven, and it's heavenly. Israel then, as you come on up through the book of Genesis, becomes the earthy. The church becomes the heavenly. And ne'er the two can meet, because there is that gulf fix, and we're going to show it on our timeline probably in the next program that you cannot mix the dealings of God with the earthly people of Israel and mix them with the heavenly people, which is the body of Christ, the church. And if only people could understand that. They are so totally different. Israel is earthy. The church is heavenly. All right, now let's go on to the next verse. As we have borne the image of the earthy, that is, being born into the human race by way of Adam, by way of our human parents, we are earthy. But we're not going to stay earthy. We shall also bear the image of the what? The heavenly. See, and that's our prospect. We are not for eternity going to be bound as earth beings. We are going to one day be transformed into that which is heavenly. And we're going to have bodies like Christ. Now it's going to come up hopefully in the next three programs after this. Because I had someone ask again, I think in the class last night. Well, what kind of a body are we going to have in the next life? Well, I just turned her right back to Philippians chapter 3 and what does it say? We are looking from the Lord from heaven. And he shall, how shall I put it? And he will change our body so that we will be fashioned after his glorious body. Well, what are you going to use for an example? Well, I tell everybody, if you want to get just a glimpse of how we are going to function in eternity, you go back into the gospel accounts and just study Christ's 40 days after resurrection. 
And there you have the perfect picture. When Mary saw him in the semi-darkness of that early dawn, she thought he was a gardener. So did he look weird? No. He looked very common and ordinary, but she just couldn't define his features enough to know who it was. The disciples saw him cooking fish on the shore. And they came up, and again he said, Well, have you got any food? Have you any meat? No. Well, put your net on the other side. See, he was very normal in all of his appearances. And then when the net came full, then Peter said, What? It's the Lord. Well, now, if, if Jesus looked bizarre and, and weird and different, well, then Peter and the eleven would have, or the ten, Judas was gone, they would have understood. But see, they didn't know who he was. He looked like just another person. And then wonder of wonders, and especially in the Luke account, when they sat down for breakfast, what did Jesus also do? He ate. See? He ate with them. And so he had all the outward appearances of another human being, but he was now immortal. He didn't have to go through the door. He could go through the wall. He could go through the ceiling. He could be transported from one place to a jillion miles away in a split second of time. I think that even the speed of light is going to become nothing for us when we get into the immortal, when we get into the eternal. And so we have this glorious prospect that we're no longer going to be tied to this old earth and be simple uh, monuments of clay. We're going to have new, resurrected, immortal, heavenly, eternal bodies. And we're not going to look weird. We're not going to look like something out of uh, some Hollywood concoction. But we are going to look just as normal from all human outward appearances as the Lord Jesus did in those 40 days from his resurrection until his ascension. Now again, even at his ascension, did he go up in some puff of a uh, spirit or a cloud? No. What did the angel say? This same Jesus, as you have seen go, will come back. And he's going to stand on this same mountain. Well, you know how I've always put it. How did he leave? Head first. He went up from the Mount of Olives, head first. How is he going to return? Feet first. Zechariah tells us as plain as day that when he returns, his feet will stand at that day on the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is there yet today, and it's waiting for him, and one day soon, he's coming to it. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldin, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported and your gift is appreciated. Thank you and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.